Good evening. Welcome to Resurrection Anglican Church on the second Sunday of Epiphany. I invite you to stand this evening and to join with us in singing our opening hymn, Songs of Thankfulness and Praise. and great commandment and the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets lord have mercy upon us christ, christ have, have mercy, mercy upon us. us lord have mercy upon us please join me in the gloria in excelsis glory, glory to god in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. 
is the light of the world. Grant your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight's first reading is taken from Exodus chapter 12, beginning in the 21st verse. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts. The Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. The word of the Lord. The psalm for this evening is Psalm 40, verses 1 through 11. We will recite it by half verse, responsibly. I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me and heard my call. He brought me out of the horrible pit, out of the mire and clay. He set my feet upon the rock and secured my footing. He has put a new song in my mouth. A song of thanksgiving unto our God. Many shall see and fear. And shall put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who has set his hope on the Lord. And has not turned to the proud or to those who go without mine. O Lord my God, great are the wondrous works which you have done, and also your thoughts toward us. There is none who can be compared with you. If I should declare them and speak of them, they would be more than I am able to. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire. But my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you have not required. And so I said, Behold, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me that I delight to do your will, O my God. Indeed, your law is within my heart. I have declared your righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not say my lips, O Lord, and that I have known. Second lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in the first verse. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in court. And to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
both their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace that, of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom we were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory, Glory to you, you, Lord Christ. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who take away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, Lord Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people, and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. These things we pray in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, here we have a continuation of the baptism account, that period of time where Jesus goes to be baptized. You recall last week, John says, it's I who should be baptized by you. He understands the hierarchy here of who is the Messiah and who is not. And he identifies the Lord in a distinctive way. Now, you remember I said over Christmas that Bethlehem was the site, Migdal Eder, where the lambs at the temple would be raised. How curious it is, how wonderful it is that here he is identifying once again Jesus, who is the Lamb of God. He's not just the Lamb of God, but the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he makes this curious but very deep and profound exclamation. 
He says, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. What's he talking about here? Again, it's sort of this hierarchy that understands this is the pre-existent, the Logos. This is the Son of God. So he understands the hierarchy here, and he says uh, he comes before me. He uh, even comes before David. It's, it's a very interesting but very important commentary that he's making. Uh, I did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water. That song of Zechariah is, is so uh, profound if you ever have a chance to look it up in the daily office and reread it. Of course, it's the story of the prayer of Zechariah when um, you remember he was struck dumb. He couldn't speak when uh, he heard that he and his wife Elizabeth were gonna have a child, and that child would be what? The great prophet John the Baptist. The thing I wanna say is sort of sacrifice, the sacrifice of a lamb or of an animal or of the produce of the land was, did not exist within Eden. Eden did not need the sacrificial system because the relationship between God and humanity, Adam and Eve, was uninterrupted and unimpeded. But of course, the fall happens. The fall happens. And Eve and Adam eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and everything comes tumbling down. That relationship that had been unimpeded, uninterrupted, was complete and holy, and the word shalom means peace, and many people believe that the kind of peace that is described in the word shalom is actually wishing for you the return to Eden when everything was right, before the sin had entered the world. And of course, Eve is created and the sin happens. And after the, the sin, they, they hide from the Lord in, in the garden. You remember that? And, and the Lord says, who said you were naked? And you can see right then something significant has happened. And so in Genesis 3.20, it, it recapitulates, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. It's implied here that there was a death that was a consequence of that sin. God, because of his love for them, and I think because of the modesty and purity of God, he wanted to cover them so their shame would not be as profound in that matter. And so it says that he made for them garments of skins and clothed them. So the first death that happens after that terrible sin was the death of the animals that provided the clothing for them. But there's another thing that happens. Then the Lord says in verse 22, behold the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now the trouble is, that all they knew before was good. Would that they not have ever learned of evil. You see, the devil never gives the complete story. He never paints the complete picture. He always leaves something profound out. The knowledge of good and evil. You know, certainly, you, you, wouldn't you like to be like God, knowing good and evil? But he didn't imply or did not even describe the cost of what that knowledge would create. And God says, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now listen to this. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now why am I bringing this up? Well, I'm bringing this up because I think it's very critical. We are temporal creations. Even in the garden, it's my sense that we were material, spiritual, yes, because of the spirit that resides within us. 
but we had a temporal existence. And as long as we were in the presence of God, we were, his radiance gave us life. And so I think that as long as we were in relationship with God and in the presence of God, just like photosynthesis happens with plants, as long as we were in his presence, we had life. He says, lest he reach out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and by implication the woman. And at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim, mighty angels, and a flaming sword that turned every, uh, that, that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So... We only have that restored eternal life when the restoration happens through the death of Jesus Christ. You see, it's nothing we can fabricate our own. I'm convinced that, that we were temporal beings, but in the presence of God in relationship fully with God, at that time, we had uninterrupted life for as long as that relationship was sustained, which would have been forever until sin entered the world. But the first death happens, not a sacrificial death, but in a sense it is because those animals had to give up their lives so that those Adam and Eve could be clothed. The second time though a sacrifice happens, in the course of time we have children born to Adam and Eve, his wife, and that is who? Cain and Abel. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So we see that sacrifice is being offered. Now, they're only, they're within the generation of their, his parents, their parents' expulsion from what? The Garden of Eden. So they're familiar with the story that mom and dad knew about their expulsion. And so it's no surprise to me that they offer to God because they know he's the great mighty creator. And so the other sad thing is Cain rises up against his brother and kills him and the Lord says, where is Abel your brother? That's another whole entire story. But the whole issue of sacrifice is a part and parcel of the understanding of the Hebrew people and in Jesus is the, the behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, the sacrificial system was so, in, in a couple of instances, first of all, in our gospel account from the Gospel of John tonight, we're reminded of, as we were in the Exodus passage, passage about the Passover lamb. Now, the Passover lamb was killed, i.e. sacrificed, so that the blood of the Passover lamb could be placed over the lentil and over the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over or pass by. So the Jews were entirely familiar with the lamb of God. Also, a goat would be sacrificed in a sense, not killed, but on one of the high feast days in Israel, the scapegoat would have the sins of the people placed on him and he'd be driven out into the wilderness. And again, there was sort of an imputation or a transfer of the sins of the people onto that goat. So too, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world was having our sins imputed onto him. But some of you might ask, I think that's what a lot of the world gets arrogant. In fact, any time we sin, we're arrogant. Because what we're saying is, I would like to exchange whatever I want to do that perhaps God has clearly said should not be entertained, that means thought about, nor should be committed. When we say, I don't care, we're exalting that thing over God. We're saying, this thing is my idol. This is the thing I will worship. It can be a host of things. It can be 
immorality, it can be sensuality, it can be money. I think it was either G.K. Chesterton or C.S. Lewis that said that, that man is about worshiping idols. We build idols and then we worship them. That's a paraphrase, but I'm pretty sure that's the two of them, both of them great writers in, uh, I think it would be the early 20th century, late 19th century in England. And so people would say, well, why does God want to kill an animal? Why does God need a sacrifice? It does say in our Psalms that he doesn't desire the sacrifice. But here's what I think he's saying here. I think what he's saying is that it would be preferable for you to be holy and set aside and not desire idolatrous things and sinful things. So that in a sense, the sacrifice that you're making to appease God for the sins that you've committed would be unnecessary if we could be holy and live holy lives. So he's not saying that he doesn't accept them, but I think he's trying to say there is a higher calling on your life. You know, there's a, there's a problem sometimes with sacrifice in the sense that, and even grace sometimes we think, well, once we've confessed we know that God is faithful to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, as it says in 1 John. But we can't do it with a sense of, how can I say it, um, where we, we imply that God's always going to forgive us and that so we can do anything because he's going to forgive us anyway. What's that? That's a sin of what? Somebody must remember what it is. It was, it was in here. What? Presumption. Yes, it is. Presumptuous sin. Because you don't know if you're going to be given the next breath. And the other thing is, you can say, well, I can always confess this before God so he'll forgive me. But that's a terrible thing to say. I think what God's saying is that he wants a contrite heart and contrite spirit. Because to think I can always ask for the forgiveness and then God will wink at it is a totally destructive thing. So why would God honor the sacrifice, let's say, for instance, of a sacrificial lamb at the temple? Well, I think there are several reasons. First of all, is we have to realize that only God can forgive sin. Now, we can forgive somebody who sins against us, but that hasn't obliterated the effect of the sin, because sin has ongoing consequences. Remember how I said the devil never gives you the full picture? He said, you'll know discerning between you know, good and evil. He didn't say what the consequences were going to be. Separation from God. No longer life everlasting in the presence of God. You're going to be kicked out of the garden. You're going to have to earn the sweat of your, uh, uh, from the sweat of your brow your, your livelihood. The wife is going to have pain in childbirth. You see all the consequences that he didn't talk about. So God is the only one that can forgive sin because he's eternal, we're temporal. And I believe that he's the only one that can restore the relationship, you see. So as we were kicked out of the garden, there needed to be something that happened so that we could be restored. And it says earlier in, I think, in either Genesis 2 or 3, do you remember that phrase I said that he would bruise, uh, I, well, it's right here. My goodness, I should be able to go back to my Bible and look it up. He says... He's talking about the snake, the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. They believe, biblical theologians believe that is a glimmer of the incarnation. But anyhow, so what I'm trying to say is that only God can forgive sin, only God can atone for a, a, a sin and restore us. The other thing about a sacrifice, it really reminds us of the destructive quality of sin. With sin comes death. With sin comes separation. And so when you sacrifice something of your herd or your flock, something that you worked hard it suddenly tells you that there has been a consequence paid. It needs to be paid. Redemption needs to be made. 
And so when we see that, it's not as though God needs the, the blood of goats, the, the aroma of, of burning flesh, but what he wants us to know. It's a, a learning experience for us. The wages of sin is death. He wants us to know there's always a cost. There's always a consequence. And the, la the, the other thing is that he, he wants us to understand that we, don't, we, we can't just skate. God's just going to wink at it. Because he's holy and he's pure, but he's not without compassion. He's not without mercy. See, the gift of God is eternal life, and if he's going to restore it, it's going to take his activity. And so when, in fact, one of the things that's really important to consider is the book of Hebrews is an actually amazing, amazing epistle because it's really talking about Jesus, the great high priest, and is trying to, to paint him in a, in a sort of in a, in a sense so that the Jews can understand the high priesthood of Jesus. How he's going to do what no mere mortal could do because it says that basically mere mortal priests in the temple sacrificed day after day, week after week, year after year, and essentially things didn't change. People still did the same things. But with the gift of Jesus and his death on the cross, he was able to break the power of sin and death. And says now in, in Hebrews 8, now the point in what we are saying is this, we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy place, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices, thus it's necessary for the priest to have something to offer. But then he says, in Christ, that redemption came, and it was a complete redemption. In verse 11 of chapter 9, it says this, When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see, there's a, an exchange that happens there. Jesus says, I am the perfect sacrifice. And John, in his wisdom, not, I guess I need to restate that. John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, suddenly spoke these words, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sin of the world. And the lovely thing that happens, of course, John is there to inspire people to repent. Repent means not only I'm sorry. <laughs> Have you ever heard somebody say something in such a way like they, they're sorry for their sins, and somehow you suspect they're really not meaning it? A kid that says to you, sorry, what do you think? Well, when we sin and we don't, are grievously wounded by our sin and it doesn't really create in us this, this sadness that we've fallen. And I think God honors that sadness and he, he actually allows us to feel that sadness and that remorse because he wants us to know we should take it seriously. But John was meant to bring to the fore a people's sense of their own imperfection and their sin and that they would go down into the waters with John for the remission of sin. So that was an act of saying, God, forgive me and wash me clean. But you know, you can't live in a river. They would have had to go day after day, week after week to experience it. But in Christ, believe it or not, when we believe and trust in him and call him our Lord and Savior, and, and we go down in, in trust into the waters of baptism, more importantly, we, we give our sin, or equally important is that we give our, our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ through repentance, which means to turn around. Not only say I'm sorry, but to turn around, which means I will go in the other direction. I will walk away from the world, 
away from these idols I've created, and I'll turn my face toward the Lord. And when we do that, then the Lord redeems us, and he pours into us his holy and life-giving spirit. And you remember how I said that it said we need to take them out of the Garden Eden, the Lord says, because they might live forever if they eat from the knowledge of the tree of life. That wasn't the end of the story because he had a solution and that was behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And so that life that existed in Eden because of the proximity and relationship with God could be restored because of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection. See, and so suddenly that which looked impossible that the devil didn't reveal about all the sadness that would happen as a consequence of that newfound knowledge that Jesus, the very Lamb of God, would give himself for the sake of the world. And that it was never meant to be a singular experience that you never shared with anybody else. Oh, I have been saved. I've come to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the first and important thing that we ought to do after that happens to us is that we share it with somebody. It certainly seemed that that was Andrew's desire. Now, you have to understand, he's following John the Baptist. He is a disciple of John the Baptist. And suddenly he sees this Messiah. John, in a sense, is passing a baton or he's handing him over to the Messiah. Where are you staying? Can you tell me more? It's sort of, I think, what's happening. And Andrew goes to uh, follow the Lord. And then very soon he brings his brother. And then sort of the rest of the call of the disciples happens. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. That was always the Lord's intention for us to, to believe and trust in him so that the restoration could take place. And even though the consequences of that first sin was destructive, if we believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, we shall be saved. And that restoration can happen, but not through our initiation, but through, through the hardwood of the cross. I guess the last thing I want to say is this, this sense of you, it, there's a prayer for mission in the morning prayer. The Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. Saving embrace. I've often thought, is he talking about embracing us? Yes. But I, I think that in, in a very curious way, in a miraculous way, that he also embraced the hardwood of the cross. When you and I would have said, no way, Jose, I would call down my angels. But he loved us so much that he gave himself for our sake. He wasn't robbed of his life. He laid it down for our sake. Thanks be to God. May we pray, gracious God, Help us to experience your life-giving power through the cross. Allow us, Lord God, to seek to offer ourselves to you completely. And then we ask you, Lord God, after we do so, to allow you, day by day, moment by moment, free access to our lives, and then breathe into us your holy and life-giving spirit. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Please stand and let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is physical and visible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, Light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, 
Blessed is the Christ, from the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and it was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one and only Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us enter into a time of prayer. The prayers of the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop. For Mark, our Diocesan Bishop. For Roger, our Bishop Emeritus. And for all the people and clergy of our, our diocese and this congregation, including Karen, our deacon, and Joe, our pastor. In our Anglican cycle of prayer, in the ACNA cycle of prayer, today we pray for the province of Sudan, and Most Reverend Ezekiel Kondo, Archbishop, and for the province of South Sudan, and the Most Reverend John Arama, Archbishop, and his wife jo Joyce. In the Anglican Diocese of the Great Lakes cycle of prayer, we pray, we pray for Ap uh, Apostles Anglican Church, located in Lexington, Kentucky its parishioners, and its clergy. Father Martin Gornick, Reverend Pam Buck, the Right Reverend Douglas Woodall, Father Scott Buck, and Deacon Trevor Durden. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For our, for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially President Biden. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, we invite your prayers and petitions at this time. Pray for Wendy as she anticipates surgery, for her safety and for healing. Pray for continued healing for Karen. We pray as well for continued healing for Lolita. We pray as well for Marilyn, Susan Rice's mom. The Lord will be with her and allow her to know her presence and that your family will strengthen Marilyn's family in the days ahead. We lift up Missy and her family. Pray for revival in this land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. From 1 Timothy 1.15, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And now I invite you to be seated as we prepare for Holy Communion. I invite you to join in the singing of our offertory hymn.
we stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All things come of Thee, O Lord, and of Thy own. Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who took on our mortal flesh to reveal his glory, that, we might, that he might bring us out of darkness and into his own glorious light. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ, Christ has died, died. Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him so that he may dwell in us and we in him. And bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. Apart from your grace, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs on your table. For you are the slain Lord, whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Body of Christ, the bread of God. Blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Peace of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. And we stand for our closing hymn this evening, ye servants of God, your master proclaim.